So, yeah, there's probably three main mechanisms which, uh, which come up with regards to connective tissue health with diet. So I just want to talk quickly about uh, bone health and protein for a moment. So I don't know if you know much about osteoporosis, but conventional teaching is that when you have weak bones, reduced density, there's nothing we can do about it. We can slow the decline, but we can't actually um, reverse it. Mm. So bone is made up predominantly of two things, calcium, and one thing that people don't realise is protein. So basically, bone is mineralized tendon or, you know, it's, a, it, it's mineralized protein. Mm. So if the body needs calcium, the calcium is stored in the bone. So the body will actually break down some of this protein matrix to get at the calcium and release it. So if you give somebody lots of calcium and lots of vitamin D, you actually reduce their need to break down more bone. And this is what the studies very clearly show. They show that when we supplement with calcium and vitamin D, we can slow down the decline in osteoporosis. Now, there was one very clever randomized control trial where at the end of it, they said, oh, we collected all this dietary data as well. Why don't we analyze the results based on protein intake? And this study was done in postmenopausal females and males over the age of 65. So the population that is considered that it's the most difficult population to deal with osteoporosis. Yeah. You can't really even help it with medication. And they found that over three years, using DEXA scanning, which is the gold standard for diagnosing bone mineral density, yeah. they were able to reverse the loss of bone mineral density in the group that was having the highest amount of animal protein. So protein and connective tissue health is an absolute no-brainer. Now, and this is well in excess of the recommended daily intake. Yeah. So the recommended daily intake of protein was calculated in college-aged males only thinking about the structural need for protein. Basically, they were thinking, well, protein is used to build, build, build stuff, mm. so we'll calculate how much stuff you're building and that will be how much protein you need. But protein also does other things. It's also involved in enzymatic processes and enzymes and things like that. So all, already you can see that uh, you've, you've missed out on one of the big dietary needs for protein. So probably um, for optimal health, you need to double that recommended daily intake for protein. Now, just to go back to your question about more specifically about knee pain mm. and if there's uh, the dietary components of that. So going back to lectins, so we know that some people and certainly people with rheumatoid arthritis there's studies when they cut wheat out of their diet, they get better. So one of these lectins that is problematic is called wheat germ agglutinin. And that can actually bind to something called glucosamine. So glucose, the sugar thing. Mm. So these lectins are carbohydrate binding proteins. So they bind to carbohydrates. And remember, sugar is a carbohydrate. So glucosamine can actually bind to the wheat germ agglutinin. Yeah. Now, if you take glucosamine at the same time that you're eating wheat, it can bind in your intestine, the, the hollow of your intestine, what we call the intestinal lumen, before it gets absorbed into your system. And this explains why there's so many people around the world that swear that glucosamine helps their joint pain. And yet when we study it, we don't see any benefit. And the reason we don't see any benefit is that the people who are getting benefit from glucosamine have an in inflammatory joint pain. And the people who we study, by definition, we say, oh, it must help osteoarthritis. We require you to have osteoarthritis that's proven on a knee x-ray. Um, so basically, we exclude the people with inflammatory pain for our study, and we only have the people with arthritis. Mm. And then we wonder why there's no clear evidence that it works. And yet, every orthopedic doctor, every surgeon, every sports doctor you ever speak to will tell you that they've got dozens and dozens of patients who swear that the glucosamine helps their system symptoms. And that's the mechanism that the glucosamine helps. It actually binds to this lectin, the wheat germ agglutinin, and stops it from having an inflammatory effect. So if you're, uh, uh, you know, have a relative on a vegetarian or a, a vegan style diet with lots of wheat um, who's having inflammatory knee pain, you could do worse than giving a trial of glucosamine. The other, as a supplement or through? As a supplement. Yeah. You just get it from a health food store. Um, 
that uh, obviously uh, that's what not, about that's, bioavailability and things like that? Because it just it it seems like it's... you don't need to absorb it. The whole point is that it binds to okay. It it, it binds. It, it doesn't matter what happens inside your body. Yeah. It's not being incorporated into the cartilage or anything like that that we used to think. All it does is it binds to this other deleterious molecule before that can be absorbed. Get it. Now, um, the other thing is that you can, uh, fatty liver will actually lead to weaker connective tissue. So all our connective tissue in the body, it's, uh, imagine you've got a cell and each cell is responsible for what we call an extracellular matrix. It's basically a sphere of scaffolding mm -hmm. around it. Bone is like this. Um, tendons, ligaments, every tissue we have, it's basically a nucleus in a cell, and then you have this zone of connective tissue. Now this connective tissue or extracellular matrix is constantly remodeling, breaking down a little bit, reforming a little bit. Now there's some circulating enzymes called matrix metalloproteinases, and they are the only enzyme in the body that can actually break this extracellular matrix down. So if you have higher levels of these circulating matrix metalloproteinases, you're basically leading to a, a, a softening or a weakening of the connective tissue. And they're produced from the liver. And when you get a fatty liver, they're produced in much, much higher concentrations. And this is why, especially when we see uh, pain from arthritis where the cartilage is already thinned out. Mm. So if you've lost a lot of your cartilage, you want the cartilage that's left to be as strong and resilient as possible. So you really want to have a low amount of these matrix metalloproteinases. And fortunately, when you lose just a small amount of body weight, it usually comes from the liver first. It usually corrects fatty liver quite early on in the piece, and then your liver stops secreting the same volume of these matrix metalloproteinases. And then that means that this uh, you don't have this softening effect on your, your connective tissues anymore. Mm. And that's why a very moderate reduction in body weight. So somebody might lose on average 10% of their body weight and the data shows that their pain will reduce by 30 to 50%. Yeah, well, and this is- 10% is a lot though. Well, 10% a lot. Well, I suppose lot. depending how heavy you are. But like if, if you lost 10% of your weight, you'd be- well, I'm I'm about eighty kilos. Yeah, so ten so, percent is uh, takes you down to low seventies. Yeah, I mean, but that that's a reason why, and we're talking about people who are obese. But if you have somebody who's one hundred and fifty kilograms, yeah, losing fifteen is not, and a they lot, go is down it? to one hundred and thirty five kilograms, makes a there's, quantum difference. They're still very very overweight. Yeah, so clearly, it's the benefit on their knee pain is not mechanical predominantly. It's these inflammatory effects and these uh, systemic effects of these matrix metalloproteinases. And it's just, a, for me, it's fascinating how you could, you know, get such a dramatic reduction. And we didn't understand it for a long time. Mm. And it was only when we were able to, when we figured out the pieces that the uh, liver makes this enzyme and the liver is the first thing that actually loses fat when you lose weight. So this is why if you lose 10% of your body weight, you still might be technically obese, but you can be metabolic health metabolically healthy in the same way that we also have the uh, the other flip of the coin what we call tofi which is thin on the outside and fat on the inside yeah so you see you go down to a park run on the weekend and how many of these guys are exercising a lot and they've all got that pot belly mm, you know these, fat. Middle, these middle aged guys with that little pot belly they're yeah. exercising they're trying to do everything they can i promise you they've got they've got fat in the wrong place yeah around their liver. Yeah.